So I'd ask you to read a chapter um, in Trisha Rose's book, uh, Black Noise, okay? And um, this book is super important. It came out, I think, in 1994. And it's like the first published book um, that really gives a serious academic look at hip-hop, that it considers hip-hop a, a subject or a topic or a culture or whatever that's worthy of academic rigor and academic study. You know, this class is in many ways the byproduct of her, of her work. And um, it's really important, you know, to, to, to note that, you know, in the early 80s, people thought rap and hip-hop culture was going to be a fad. It was going to be gone in five or ten, five or ten years, you know. Um, you know, never would you think that it was, it was like, be taught in freaking co college, uh, college courses from some dude, you know, on a tractor <laughs> at his farm. Um, but, you know, if you go through some of her chapter, and she, you know, she's uh, you know, very academic, um, in this so I apologize if some of it was hard to read through and I'm just gonna pick the the bits out of here right you know and she talks about well hip-hop is the byproduct it's the derivative of 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 certain circumstances or whatever you know uh, the first is deindustrialization we know this right we, we got a lot of this stuff but she kind of puts it um, in a more academic sort of frame um, you know, gentrification, urban renewal. I mean, she, she kind of goes over the story that we talked about, but she specifically relates it, um, like, like I do, to, to hip-hop culture. Um, you know, we have a, a bankrupt, almost a bankrupt city um, and, with massive class gaps. But I think the one thing that she really focuses on is that hip-hop is, like, born out of limited means, right? Um, Think about all these young kids, their after-school programs are shot, they, there's no music classes anymore, all that stuff's been cut because of pl plan shrinkage. You know, so what do they have? Well, they got a stereo system in their house. Everybody had a stereo system, you know. Um, they got their pops and mom's records, their uncle's records, you know. So they had the tools, the, you know, the basic tools were lay laying around the crib, you know, and it just took someone to figure out that they could do something with that and um, that would be cool Herc and do it in a very specific way. Um, and she says all the stuff that we've talked about, right? Hip, hip hop's about fame, it's about status, it's about um, a style and identity, it's about appropriating you know, text and technology and symbols um, and, and therefore critique through your style. It's about turf. And it's about competition, right? These are all things that, you know, I've been talking about today, but she goes into, into depth. So, DJ Cool Herc. This is, you know, this is the dude. This is the god, you know. Um, however you want to say it, Cool Herc is the father, the founding father of hip-hop culture. You'd call him the inventor or whatever. And um, you may not be that impressed with what he did, but, you know, as a young teenager um, what he gave birth to is you know the Kanye West of the world I mean it was crazy like I don't know five or six years ago his sister was doing a GoFundMe type thing because the dude was working at FedEx and didn't have health benefits and needed to have some um, some stones removed you know you know what I'm saying where where people are making crazy money off of what he started, you know, what he what he started. So, anyways, he's from Kingston, Jamaica. Um, came to the South Bronx. I don't know when he was quite quite young, maybe ten or eleven. His real name is Clive Campbell, um, and basically, you know, he 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 at a very young age, um, you know, uh, took this Jamaican sound clash vibe right and he tried to throw some parties and he threw some parties where he he played jamaican music and despite the fact that you know there was a huge uh caribbean diaspora in new york city meaning people from all over the caribbean that were living there um working there whatever um they weren't vibing on on the, the the reggae music you know on the dub music so he he he, he dropped that pretty quick but basically 
you know, we can talk about hip hop starting on this one day, August 11th, 1973. Um, Kuhurk lived at, um, you know, 1520 Sedgwick Ave, which is now like a historical site in New York City because of Kuhurk. Um, and across the street is Cedar Park. Um, and he gave his first jam, you know, the DJs called it jams, um, where he, he basically started to come up with hip hop culture in a, in, in a sort of obtuse way. But uh, he gave a jam on August 11, 1973 to raise money for his sister for some new school clothes, his older sister. And he did it in the basement like rec center of, of the apartment building that, that he lived in, right? And this is, so, he, so he started doing these parties, and what he would realize is at these parties, there were certain parts, and, and you know, Herc was looking for like, he was playing records like that weren't being played on the radio, that wasn't being played in the discotheques. He was looking for like the raw soul stuff, you know, he just had a real nice taste to him, you know, and you know when you're a kid, like, you don't necessarily always want to do the mainstream shit like you're looking for like the underground stuff for, for whatever reason you know um he was on that same tip and um basically he would give these parties and he realized that a couple of his parties like when a certain part of a song james brown you know give it up turn it loose would hit people would lose their shit they'd hit the floor their dance moves would go crazy and like you know and he observed that and he was like damn you know, and um, he started to call that part of a record The Get Down. That's where that Netflix series gets its name from. The, the Get Down was the break because people would get down on the floor and they would dance at his party. So, um, you know, uh, Herc then had this epiphany. He was like, yo, like people, you know, I got all these records with the Get Down parts on them. Um, what if I just played that part? What if I just had parties where I just played the get down part, where I just played that part? And uh, essentially that's what he would do. And he called this technique the merry-go-round, where basically his whole thing was, you know, playing records with a get down part and playing the get down part um, of the record and just having the most bugged out parties. And he became like the biggest DJ, the most popular person, you know, DJ in the Bronx because he had a booming, banging system. He had, you know, and he had the dopest breaks. Like he had the dopest records with the dopest breaks. And he unearthed and made popular a lot of the songs that you, you, you should have listened to um, coming into this, this unit. Uh, uh, you know, Apache by Michael Viner's Incredible Bongo Band. Uh, Dennis Coffey, Scorpio, The Mexican by Babe Ruth, um, you know, and and um, Bongo Rock by Viner, and I'm trying to think, uh, Dennis Coffey, Scorpio, uh, was, was one, Jimmy Castor, Bunch, We've Just Begun, those were all cool Herc records, and of course, James Brown, Give It Up, Turn It Loose, Clap Your Hands, Stomp Your Feet, Clyde, tap. Badoom tap. Um, anyways, uh, yeah, I mean, like, he would just play those those parts of those records, mind you, very sloppily. I'll I'll, I'll try to do a little um, video, you know, uh, where I show you um, uh, the merry-go-round. But that was Cool Herc's technique for just playing the get down or the break parts of the records for a whole party. And this is what blew him up and made him the most important, you know. DJ in the South Bronx in the early 1970s. Um, eventually, his parties got too big for the rec center, so they moved out to uh, Cedar Park. And all of the DJs that kind of came after him that started doing the same thing, because a lot of people started realizing, yo, I got that, I got that record. You know, I got that record. I know that song, you know. Um, they started throwing parties, too, and, and in parks. And you know, um, that's like a major part. And I'll talk about, you know, park jams uh, or jams. And, and, you know, you talk to any uh, pioneer DJ. We're talking pioneer DJs are like DJs from the 70s. You know, they would say, we gave a jam. We give jams. So they'd give parties for the people. You know what I'm saying? And the people that would get down to his, his uh, break beats, his get down parts, they became the break boys and the break girls. That's where breaking 
and b-boying, the break boy, break girl, that's where that all comes from. It comes from Herc's parties. Okay? His crew was known as the Herculoids. Um, and, you know, Herc was like a big dude. Is a big dude. Big dude. Big, you know, big dude. Big presence. And his sound system was called the, the Her Herculoids. And he had like the most powerful system, you know. And again, because he got more and more popular, he could charge a little bit more for his jams. And he could get better, better equipment and all that stuff. Um, you know, as people started catching on, and, you know, people start going to his parties and they start, you know, trying to DJ, you know, do their own thing. You know, uh, these DJs would battle for territory. They battle for, um, you know, uh, equipment, who had the loudest system, who had the most exclusive breaks. You know, Herc was known for uh, putting records in different sleeves so no, no one could spy and know which actual records they were. Or he would uh, heat wash or heat wipe the labels off. So... Uh, you know, boil water in a tea kettle and hold the record over it and then peel off the label um, or put a different label over it or cross everything off. Um, this is what a lot of DJs did because their whole reputation you know, was based upon the, the breaks they had, the music that they had, you know. Um, and a couple of years later, in 1974, the first MC, the first, first master ceremonies, microphone controller, whatever you want to sort of think about it, vocalist came on at Herc's par parties. His name was, you want to know this, Coke La Rock, okay? And, you know, very much in the same sort of vibe as like the Jamaican sound system, Sound Clash was like, you know, this was, this was highly improvisational, you know what I'm saying? Um, uh, a lot of, you know, just like little freestyles or like, yo, Tommy, your mom's here, like, you know, or like whatever, you know, or cool Herc, Herc, Herc in the house how you know just stuff like that nothing like crazy but he was known as like the first person to be vocal um you know and get on the mic and do do that thing okay so the mc came later you know um and that's a big part it came after the djs came after the b-boys and b-girls